But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. Active Christian Media presents On the Wall Radio with your hosts, Randall and Stacy Harp. Ecclesiastes 10.1 says, As dead flies give perfume a bad smell, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. Isn't that true? Yes, it is true. Flies are associated with folly. That's right. Which got me thinking right before the show. You know how people always say, if I could only be a fly on the window, or if I could only be a fly on the wall, you know. Basically eavesdrop on a conversation. Yeah, really. Which well, is folly. <laughs> well, yeah, but the thing is, is it's like they, if I can only be a fly, or if if you can only, if you only had a brain, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, if you only had a brain, no. <laughs> If if you're you're a fly, it's the only time anybody wants to be a fly. When flies are around, people want to fly swatter so they can whap those flies and kill them. Shoe fly, don't bother me. Exactly, exactly. So I was just thinking about that as I was eating my veggie veggie chips earlier. And uh, any reason, any sort of trigger there eating veggie chips and thinking about flies? No, I was just tw- reading Twitter, and just uh. some of the things on Twitter made me laugh. And I'm thinking, and then that thought popped into my mind. If I can only be a fly on the wall, was the whole purpose of the fly on the wall would be to, to eavesdrop, right? Right. Okay, well, if you're going to eavesdrop, why don't you... To clandestinely listen. Have bigger ears. I mean, you know, this presumes flies can even hear. Yeah. I mean, can they? I don't know. And if you were a fly, could you comprehend what you were hearing? I know. Such is the English language, everyone. <laughs> I think that's why they call. I think that's what they call minuscule listening devices bugs. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, very good, very good. All right, so everybody, welcome to this edition of On the Wall Radio, which has nothing to do with anything we were just talking about. <laughs> well, just so you know, it just was funny to me. I thought it was funny. So uh, um, anyway, so on the Wall Radio dot com. Just want to let you know. Um, Last week, uh, my friend, Dr. Chaplain Gordon James Schmidt interviewed me on his TV show. And uh, that that episode is already online here in our Blog Talk Radio archives. The audio thereof. Yeah, the audio of the show. Um, the video will be up uh, probably, hmm, I'm not sure when it will be up. I'm sure he'll have it up sometime this week, if you, if you so desire. <laughs> To go and see me, and you. I just have to tell you the behind the scenes thing. It's really funny. Chaps cracks me up. He's like, "Hey, Stace, will you do me a favor? Will you be my guinea pig?" And I'm like, "Okay." And um, I'm like, "What do you want me to do?" And he's like, "I want to interview you on my show because I want to practice using Skype." And so he told me, he said, "Make sure you, you know, wear something nice. And, you know, you can put makeup on. That would be good. Not that you look bad without it or anything, but uh, anyway, so." He, he was basically telling me to look presentable for TV. I'm like, okay, whatever. And uh, so anyway, the day came, and, and I forgot, what was it Wednesday or Thursday? I can't remember. I think it was Wednesday. Was it Wednesday? I, think. I don't recall. Anyway, so him and his friend call me up, who's the producer of his daily show. And, and, uh, and the way we ended up doing this was I was on Skype, and Chaps was on the cell phone, and I was I was talking to him through the computer, but I couldn't hear him through the computer because I couldn't hear him, even though there was a camera on him. And we did two takes, right? It was, and, and not only that, I put on a sweater because it was like one of the nicer things I own. It was really hot the day that we did it. I'm like, oh my gosh! And then we're here. I'm sitting here in our in our studio room, and we have no blinds yet because we're waiting for our windows to get you know changed. And which hopefully will be tomorrow. Hopefully the guy will come tomorrow and take our windows out while it's not raining. And uh, anyway, so long story short, um, it took an hour to shoot like three minutes because of the sun. It kept moving and 
and then chaps kept asking me all these questions I didn't know the answer to and <laughs> And then he's like, hey, do you want me to promote anything of yours? And I said, sure, why not you why don't you promote my book, Five Successful Ways to Stay Depressed? And he asked me, what's that about? And I'm thinking, uh, doesn't the title give it away? <laughs> anyway, I, I was telling Randall, I listened to the audio, and I thought, oh, my gosh, that sounds so, that sounds like a doofus. Anyway, the, the thing the thing he he wanted me to talk about was something I'm so familiar with, not uh, he wanted me to talk about the Plan B pill, the 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 abortion pill. What's that called? The day, oh, the know. morning after. There you go. Uh, and how the FDA just decides that that they're going to lower the age of consent to 15 years old, and say, hey, if you're 15, you can do it. But hey, if you need to go on a field trip or take an aspirin at your school, forget it. You guys need a parent, you know, to sign your paper and say it's okay for you to take an aspirin. Yeah, if you're 15 and you don't need a prescription, you don't need a note from a parent or a doctor or anything like that, just go to your local pharmacy and or drugstore and buy it. It's ridiculous. Anyway, yeah. so Chaps asked me a question. He's, and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and I said that in the video. And you know the so fast, it was a quiz, not it, an interview. Well, yeah. You know the funny part though is they they're not to the point where they can really edit it yet. So I I I kind of feel like I. I've, I look like an idiot. He introduces me as a marriage and family therapist, you know, somebody who has some knowledge. And then he asked me a simple question. And because I was nervous and hot and I didn't I was I didn't answer it the way I thought I was and I'm I was like, Great <laughs> This is gonna be on cable T V on religious news networks and I don't look like a complete doofus. Oh well. So I thought I'd share that with you. So if you want to go to the archives, it's the May it was the show over the weekend. It's May, May, the May, May 11th show, I think it is. Oh. Yeah, for the first first part. But anyway, all right. So enough of that. So what we're going to do now is we are going to enter into our Bible study, and I, this week we're in John chapter 10. Uh, which is that cool or what? You know what? Here it is, May. We've been in the book of John all all year, and uh, this book is to me, it's awesome. I mean, the whole Bible is awesome, but the Gospel of John is really cool because it gives you a different perspective than Matthew, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Yeah. And um, uh, it's it's filled with pictures, word pictures, and stories. And anyway, John chapter ten is, is a pretty popular chapter. And uh, so, do you have any comments? Yeah, it's just it is. Uh great book it's not one of the synoptic gospels that is it's not a synopsis of jesus life in a chronological sort of thing or jesus ministry i should say uh john had a much different purpose in writing and that's showing uh his divinity concentrating on that while the other gospels do uh display his divinity uh john had that specifically in mind and and chose the conversations, a lot of conversations that he has in detail that the other gospel writers didn't um, elaborate on quite so much. And and just about, I think it's just more like a, a character sort of study in, in the life of Jesus rather than um, the things that he did places he went um john the holy spirit through john really brings out i think the the character of christ in this gospel okay so let's let's begin then in john chapter 10 i'm going to read through verse well my bible breaks it up at verse 21 so i'll read through uh, verse 21 of john 10 in the new american new american standard version because that is the correct Bible. For what? For me to read. Okay. Okay, here it is. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all of his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. 
A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold, and they are not Mormons. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will not become one flock with one shepherd. I know you're trying not to laugh, huh? (laughs) I'm sorry. I couldn't read this. Uh, For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that they may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. A division occurred again among the Jews because of these words. Many of them were saying, he has a demon and is insane. Why do you listen to him? And others were saying, these are not the sayings of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind. Can he? And a good question. And that is the question that arose in the last chapter about, you know, um, Give glory to God that uh, you can see they told the once blind man, but <laughs> but Jesus is a sinner. And the man replied, well, you a sinner? I, I, I don't know, but this I do know. Once I was blind, now I see. And uh, they had trouble. The religious leaders had trouble with this notable miracle. I can speak really, can that have been done. Um, uh, but had trouble accepting Jesus as Messiah. And his last chapter closed out. Could he be the Messiah? Miracle man. Part of the plan. Hello. Hello. Um, Sorry. The uh, MJW song got in my head. As Jesus uh, pointed out to them, the religious leaders, uh, basically said they were blind because they said they could see. Now, if they admitted they were blind, then they wouldn't uh, have their sin with them. But basically because they said, we know it all and and we can see what's going on here, which they really couldn't. I can see clearly their now sin, the rain is gone. The remain, their sin remained with them. There wasn't an opportunity there for them for to repent and be forgiven because they wouldn't even admit that they were in sin. Which leads me to another question. Have you been influenced by the world and Casey Kasem or the Holy Bible? Yes. Not so much Casey Kasem. <laughs> I think I listened to the Top 40 Countdown maybe. Um, it was a complete staple in my life growing up. <laughs> I'm sure I could count the times on one hand. but Anyway. So, moving on. Through verse 10, I think it's important to get the context here because I do think that it was part of that same um, discourse that he was having with the religious leaders and those who were uh, standing by. Recall that the scriptures originally were written in chapters and verses. They were just written. There aren't chapter divisions. That's something that was added uh, much later. That would have been such so later. To write it that way too, you know, putting a little A for the first part of the verse, oh, and sure, a yeah. little B, and then, yeah. Anyway. Anyway, centuries later, that was added as a way to to reference 
uh, the scriptures, places in the scriptures. So, uh, rather than no, oh, just uh, the Gospel of John about oh, I don't know, three thousand words in, uh, just so there wasn't a chapter division. So the chapter divisions I think are helpful for referencing, but sometimes they're um, not so helpful and that it breaks up the context sometimes unnecessarily. Yeah. So Jesus, again, as uh, John often records him saying, he begins his statement saying, Amen, Amen, uh, verily, verily, in the King James, or your, your uh, translation might say truly, truly. But once again, Jesus is uh, affirming his own statement as true uh, before he even says it. Whereas the practice was then and still is, when somebody says something that's true, you attest to it by saying, Amen, Amen, um, which is a um, Hebrew slash Aramaic term, which means truly, that's the truth. That's right, brother. <laughs> that's the way it is. That's the truth. Verily. And so. maybe maybe we should reinstitute that in today's modern vernacular. What instead of saying amen to say that's verily, right. Verily, verily. Or very verily. Verily. Um Verily, and, verily, verily, verily. La 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 <laughs> Name that name name that tune. Do you know what it is? It's row 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 your boat. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Only those kinds of words. I know. Um, I just made them up. Yeah, I can tell. <laughs> uh-huh. This is serious business. So, uh, the Lord here, not waiting for anyone to uh, affirm what he's saying, he says it from the beginning, because he knows what's about to leave his lips is true. He says, Amen, amen, I say to you, the one not entering through the door into the sheepfold, but going up by another way, that one is a thief and a robber. Now, this next few sentences, I mean, it's pretty... Oh, I mean, wait, 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 wait. Do you know what the difference between a thief and a robber is? I do. I do, too. Really? Yeah. A thief is simply uh, someone who steals something. A, a robber is someone who confronts someone. Usually with a gun. Yeah. Or a pickaxe. Or, or something, just sort of a weapon or, you know, a threat. If you... You can't... <clears throat> If you, in the law, we distinguish as burglary and robbery. In the law, we? Are yeah. you a lawyer now? No, the collective The collective we, we. okay. I just want, want to make sure all of a sudden you were a lawyer, you're saying we, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, he's a lawyer, who knew? Anyway, if if you, you know, open your door to your house, you're coming home, the door is unlocked, it's jar, and everything's, um, you know, in disarray, and some things are missing... You go, oh, no, I've been robbed. Well, that's really incorrect. You've not been robbed. You've been bur- Your house has been burglarized. Some things have been stolen from you, but technically you weren't robbed because you weren't confronted by the person wishing to take something by force. So, anyway, yes. You know, it is interesting, though. I mean, not to, you know, spend all eternity on this verse, but in verse 1 when it says that, when it says that the other one, he is a thief and a robber. I think that's an indicator of the type of person we could see in the pulpit, you know, yeah. because because there are those in the pulpit who who are who are thieves. They don't they they steal money from people, you know. They also steal valuable time, and there are also robbers. And I don't even have to tell you because those are the manipulators and yeah. you know and all that. So. I don't think it's a mistake that the Lord would use these words. Yeah. Yeah, story comes to mind, but... Oh, um, tell me it. I want to hear it. Tell me the story. Well, I once went, uh, visited church to see a vocal group, a choir, um, a gospel choir perform. Uh, Some friends were in it, and they said, oh, we're going to be performing at this church. And I went, and and this particular church had a collection uh, so they had their service, and they had a, a time of offering, and one of those types of offerings where they, you know, play the music, and everybody comes forward and, you know, drops their money in the 
uh, on the basket or bike or whatever in, in sight of everyone else, which I have difficulty with. But be that as it may. So I did this, and then um, and then the pass was well, time for another round, and and people come around again, and and he said, "Well, we're not ending this until we have I forget what it was, four thousand dollars or five thousand dollars or whatever." He named out some amount, and and he wasn't going to stop the offering. They were con- continue to have people come back up, give money until they had a certain amount, and. And I'd come there for, you know, to encourage the gospel choir. And and I was there, I don't know, uh, it was well over an hour of offering time. And the pastor's saying, we're just going to keep going. And, and you're all being, you're all being greedy and selfish. And, you know, we're going to keep doing this until we get a certain amount. I'd. Eventually, I grew tired of all that nonsense and, and walked out. So, anyway, so talking about robbers made me think of that. Um, all right. Well, let's go to a break. Should we? Let's do it. In the primeval history of Genesis, an ancient war began between the seed of the serpent and the seed of Eve. Fallen angels called Watchers begot a race of giants called Nephilim, their goal. To stop the bloodline of the promised seed. But God had other plans. Chronicles of the Nephilim is a biblical fantasy series of novels that charts the rise and fall of the Watchers and the Giants in the stories of the Old Testament and in between. Noah Primeval, Enoch Primordial, Gilgamesh Immortal, Abraham Allegiant, and more to come. By author and Hollywood screenwriter Brian Gadawa. Available on Kindle and paperback at Amazon.com. Go to ChroniclesOfTheNephilim.com and enter a world of ancient history and biblical imagination. That's ChroniclesOfTheNephilim.com. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Faith on Earth is a new book that appraises the effectiveness of Christianity from its inception through rapid growth in the early centuries and up to its recent decline in strength and influence. Is there hope for the future? Faith on Earth scripturally lays out the background and rationale of God's plan for the world and how the individual born-again believer is integral to making a difference. Faith on Earth by Lou Pamakis from Nordskog Publishing and available at Amazon.com and other book retailers. Faith on Earth by Lou Pamakis. Introducing CountryWhispers.org, the place to go buy your unique handcraft soaps Wickless jar candles and warmers, and to find a wonderful gift for the holidays and all year long. You'll find decorating items to enhance your home decor, natural beauty products, and more at countrywhispers.org. Visit countrywhispers.org today and add a special touch to your home. Countrywhispers.org, your home away from home. What's on God's Sin List for Today by author Tom Hobson. This book is designed to help you find solid answers to the question, which parts of the Bible are timeless and universal, and which parts are only for the people to whom the Bible was first written. What's on God's Sin List for Today is available at Lifeway Christian Bookstores and online outlets including Amazon.com and Barnes & Noble. What's on God's Sin List for Today by author Tom Hobson. The Before I Formed You Foundation is a non-profit organization co-founded by renowned Christian artist Ron DeCiani and his son Grant. The purpose of this foundation is to reach every abortion clinic, crisis pregnancy center, and OBGYN in the U.S. to celebrate life. If we can turn just one mother's heart toward God and save an unborn life, what is that worth? To learn more about how you can help with prayer, donations, or a partnership, go to www.formedyou.org. That's www.formedyou.org. Next on the Pray in Jesus' Name show, Dr. Chaps will pray about these important issues. Here's a battle we're fighting at PrayInJesusName.org. The Pentagon has literally threatened to court-martial Christian troops if they talk about their faith in Jesus Christ. Lieutenant Commander Nate Christensen backpedaled a little bit. He said this week, oh no, it's okay if they evangelize, 
but they can be punished if they proselytize. So what's the difference between these two words? If, if they're evangelizing, they won't be punished. If they're proselytizing, they will. Well, that's explained by Lieutenant Colonel Laurel Tingley, who said, On duty, Air Force members are free to express their religious beliefs as long as it does not make others uncomfortable. Proselytizing grows over that line. So in other words, you can talk about Jesus as long as nobody's offended. But the minute you talk about Jesus and somebody gets offended, you can be court-martialed for proselytizing? That's not right. Sign a petition today at PrayInJesusName.org. God bless you in Jesus' name. This is Chaplain Gordon James Klingenschmidt, Dr. Chaps. Please join me every Saturday for two full hours as we report the news, discern the spirits, and pray the scriptures in Jesus' name. And then on Sunday, again, I invite you to join me for one hour Bible study that will help you understand the will of God for your life. That's three full hours of important programming every Saturday and Sunday right here on the Active Christian Media Network. And please support Randall and Stacy Harp at ActiveChristianMedia.com. You are listening to On the Wall Radio on the Active Christian Media Network. Everybody, welcome back. I want to let you know there's this breaking news. Dr. Dr. Kermit Gosnell, the abortionist, has been found guilty of killing three babies born alive, acquitting in the fourth baby's death. Literally, this has been something I've been watching for almost 45 minutes on Twitter as people are uh, in the pro-life movement are trying to, you know, hoping that this guy's found guilty. I mean, we don't even want to go into all the stuff that this guy has done. Uh, but uh, I'm just going to tell you that he has been found guilty, which is a major answer to the prayer. And I'm telling you something. The media didn't want you to know this story. And Twitter, thanks thanks for Twitter and all the activists on Twitter who got the word out, including Patricia Heaton from The Middle, the TV show, uh, which was just renewed, by the way. <laughs> that was breaking news earlier on Twitter. But let me tell you also something about Twitter. Don't use their ad services. They will completely rip you off like they did me. They they stole $16 from me. They refused to give it back. So if you have uh, anything you want to use for Twitter ads, I don't use Twitter. They'll rip you off. I set up an account, put my credit card in, and they ripped me off. Not one ad of mine ever went out, and they ripped me off. I just contacted support. And they will not give me my money back. They rip me off. So do not use Twitter ads. They will rip you off. They're good for other stuff, but don't give them any money. So back to our get back to our Bible study now. <laughs> it's like, come on, sixteen dollars. They won't give me my money back, and they charged it without asking me. That's the that's the amazing part. Uh, well, what so, did they charge you for? So I, apparently, when you go in and you set up an account, if you're you're trying to do something a promoted tweet, they if you put your credit card in, they're going to charge it. They charged me eight dollars last week and eight dollars the week before, and I'm like, "Where? Why are you guys charging me?" Well, you said, and and they finally answered me. I tweeted them probably a hundred times on their support uh-huh. account, uh-huh. not one response. And uh, yesterday, as you and me were talking, I finally found out a different way to go, and they finally got back in touch with me, and they said, "Oh, we didn't do anything wrong. You used our service." And I'm like, "No, I didn't. You look in there. There's no ad set up." So, uh, anyway. So it's eight dollars for the privilege of having an account that you just in case you ever want to do something with it. You know, let, let me just do a quick contrast here. Fitbit. Let me tell you, Fitbit. This is this little uh, pedometer tracker. It's pretty uh, people wear to track how many steps they walk. Just to give you a quick difference in customer service. Uh, Twitter won't give me my sixteen bucks back that they ripped off from me. Uh, for nothing, <laughs> literally, they gave me nothing. Okay, I bought this Fitbit thing. You guys talk, heard me talk about this a long time ago, um, and I lost the port dock on it. I haven't been able to use this thing in about a year. I lost it. I don't know where it is. So I thought, well, on the off chance, I know Fitbit has great customer service. I'm just going to email them and find out if they'll send me one. And I did, and instantly, without question, without a question, they said, oh yeah, we'll send you. You're another dock, and then you can take your Fitbit and charge it. And if you can't get it to work, we'll send you a brand new Fitbit. And I told them, honestly, I said, I moved and I lost my dock. I don't know where it is. Not There was nothing on their part. They did not have to send me this thing. 
Yeah. But they see that's a good company. Twitter, not so much. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, back to the study. <laughs> back to the Bible study. Let's move this along. So Jesus tells them something that they already knew. This was the practice of keeping sheep. This was the uh, you know kind of like the day in the life of the shepherd. Uh, normally at night, and probably still happens in sheep keeping uh, societies. Uh, you'd keep your sheep in the field, but if there was, as we read in Luke's gospel, the shepherds were there with their keeping their sheep in the fields by night. You know, the sheep would just bed down there in, in the field. But in the case of inclement weather or, uh, you know, any other kind of threat, maybe uh, a known pack of wolves or something like that, and they wanted to take the sheep inside, you know, off out of the field, there were these common sheep folds, um, pens, you know, in, in the caves or, you know, corrals that basically all the shepherds could bring their sheep together and all the sheep would go together in one big sheep fold. And then come morning when it was time to take the sheep out, the shepherd would call his sheep and his sheep would come out. And, you know, the other would stay behind because they weren't familiar with his voice and his call. And so... Jesus is just telling them something pretty basic, which they already know about keeping sheep. However, he goes on to say that, uh, you know, in verse, verse 6 uh, tells us that when he said this, they did not know of what, that what it was he was speaking to them. It's because they're thinking, yeah, so what? Are we getting a... Uh, a lesson in sheep keeping? What, what's the deal? And then verse 7, truly, truly, verily, verily, amen, amen. I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Um, how many of you know that Jesus wasn't the first one to come along uh, claiming to be Messiah? Uh, well, he wasn't. Uh, I can't help but think of Acts chapter 5 after uh, the religious leaders, religious leaders deal harshly with Peter and John. Uh, Gamaliel, um, one of the Sanhedrin, a Pharisee, uh, he stands up and he says, uh, let me pick it up verse 35, Acts 5.35, and said to them, you men of Israel, take heed for yourselves that what you intend to do as concerning these men. For before the days, these days rose up, Thaddeus boasting himself to be someone, to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to nothing. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing, and drew away much people after him. Uh, he also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. Anyway, so he just brings up two in in recent memory that they would be aware of. And so Jesus is saying, all that came before me, claiming to be somebody, were just thieves and robbers. But, um, you know, uh, so the... Sh uh, the sheep didn't hear them. Uh, they let away some people, but being not everybody, as Gamaliel pointed out, 400 here and a bunch of people there, and they all came to nothing. A bunch of them died, especially Judas and Galilee, as he's talking about. Uh, uh, <clears throat> there was, um, I drew quite a number who uh, didn't go well with the Roman government. Many people lost their lives. And and there's been no shortage of <laughs> false messiahs since uh, the Lord Jesus. Many of them claiming to be Jesus reincarnated and stuff like that. It's just amazing the number who've come along since uh, claiming. But at the time here, Jesus saying, all that came before me uh, are thieves and robbers. The sheep did not hear them. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and will go out, you know, go into the sheepfold, come out and find pasture. 
uh, all those others, the thieves and robbers that came before him, they didn't uh, find pasture. They found their deaths is what they found uh, following these false messiahs. It did not go well for the false messiahs nor for their followers. But Jesus saying, I'm the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. They will go in and go out and, and will find pasture. Uh, using that uh, metaphor again of uh, keeping sheep. Um, the sheep going in the sheepfold, coming safely out and finding pasture by going through him. And verse 10, the thief does not come except that he may steal, kill, and destroy. And often people look at that and think of Satan, and I think that's true of Satan. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I think the main sort of activity of Satan is to lie, to sow confusion. He's the father of lies, a liar from the beginning. And he works at Twitter. <laughs> well. In their ad department. A little extreme. No, but, they're, they're thieves. Okay. But going. But anyway. <laughs> you know, going back to the first appearance in Scripture, Genesis chapter 3, you know. Uh, or for chapter two, uh, you know, has God said, oh, well, that's not what he meant, you know, and then throws this doubt and starts lying. And that's so whereas verse 10, I think, can apply to Satan. I think it's more generally applies looking to context. All who came before me were thieves and robbers and just talking about these false messiahs, these false teachers, these false prophets who come along. The thief does not come except that he may steal, kill, and destroy. And if you look at those uh, false messiahs that came before Jesus and those that came after, that's their M.O. Uh, they were out to make a name for themselves uh, in their delusion, in their um, deception, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, things didn't go well for either them or their followers. Jesus says, I came that they may have life and may have it abundantly. That's the difference between him, uh, the true Messiah, and all the false messiahs. Uh, they've come to steal, kill, and destroy. He's come to give life, and not just life, but abundant life. I am the good shepherd. Verse 11, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Not the other way around. <laughs> to the false messiahs, I can't help but think of um, like Muhammad, whatnot, uh, require that the sheep lay down their life for them. You know, But Jesus says, I, in the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He doesn't require those others to kill him, themselves for him. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Uh, verse 12, but the hired hand, the hireling, uh, not even being a shepherd, he says. You know what? Can I just say something? It is, it is interesting more. because it's interesting that, that this text here uses the term hired hand. Hmm. And I don't know about you guys out there listening but in every single church I've ever gone to here in America, and primarily California because I haven't actually gone to one here yet in Tennessee, but every church, without exception, they hired the pastor. It was never a person who was raised up from within the body of believers there, which I think is how it should be um, to, yeah. to actually shepherd the people. Every well, single, that sounds biblical. I know every single day. Paul told Timothy in these churches to find, you know, right. trustworthy that's, men who were. I think that's really key, though, because um, because the hiring implies money. Yeah. And not that shepherds couldn't get paid anything. That's not my point. Um, my point is that in the American church, it's a business. You hire somebody. Like at our last church, they hired this guy from a completely different state. He came in, he preached one time, and then he was offered a job. Oh. Really? That's it? Yeah. It, it just it just it drives me crazy. Anyway, I know I could go on, but I won't. Yeah. Um, yeah that's a good point. And it's a very good point. Very astute. And continuing with this metaphor, 
Jesus says the the hired hand, uh, not even being a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, forsakes the sheep, and flees. And the wolf seizes them and scatters the sheep. Um, the one who's uh, hired hand, uh, who doesn't uh, doesn't own the sheep, he's not really interested in the welfare of the sheep. Uh, he's there for for the money, basically. And if the wolf comes, uh, be it the false prophet, you know, uh, a destructive heresy, whatever. Uh, basically, that's not my job, not my responsibility. And the sheep uh, get torn and, and scattered. In the primeval history of Genesis, an ancient war began between the seed of the serpent and the seed of Eve. Fallen angels called Watchers begot a race of giants called Nephilim, their goal. To stop the bloodline of the promised seed. But God had other plans. Chronicles of the Nephilim is a biblical fantasy series of novels that charts the rise and fall of the Watchers and the Giants in the stories of the Old Testament and in between. Noah Primeval, Enoch Primordial, Gilgamesh Immortal, Abraham Allegiant, and more to come. By author and Hollywood screenwriter Brian Gadawa. Available on Kindle and paperback at Amazon.com. Go to ChroniclesOfTheNephilim.com and enter a world of ancient history and biblical imagination. That's ChroniclesOfTheNephilim.com. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Faith on Earth is a new book that appraises the effectiveness of Christianity from its inception through rapid growth in the early centuries and up to its recent decline in strength and influence. Is there hope for the future? Faith on Earth scripturally lays out the background and rationale of God's plan for the world and how the individual born-again believer is integral to making a difference. Faith on Earth by Lou Pamakis from Nordskog Publishing and available at Amazon.com and other book retailers. Faith on Earth by Lou Pamakis. Introducing CountryWhispers.org, the place to go buy your unique handcraft soaps, wickless jar candles, and warmers, and to find a wonderful gifts for the holidays and all year long. You'll find decorating items to enhance your home decor, natural beauty products, and more at CountryWhispers.org. Visit CountryWhispers.org today and add a special touch to your home. CountryWhispers.org, your home away from home. What's on God's Sin List for Today by author Tom Hobson. This book is designed to help you find solid answers to the question, which parts of the Bible are timeless and universal, and which parts are only for the people to whom the Bible was first written. What's on God's Sin List for Today is available at Lifeway Christian Bookstores and online outlets including Amazon.com and Barnes & Noble. What's on God's Sin List for Today by author Tom Hobson. The Before I Formed You Foundation is a non-profit organization co-founded by renowned Christian artist Ron DeCiani and his son Grant. The purpose of this foundation is to reach every abortion clinic, crisis pregnancy center, and OBGYN in the U.S. to celebrate life. If we can turn just one mother's heart toward God and save an unborn life, what is that worth? To learn more about how you can help with prayer, donations, or a partnership, go to www.formedyou.org. That's www.formedyou.org. Next on the Pray in Jesus Name show, Dr. Chaps will pray about these important issues. Here's a battle we're fighting at PrayInJesusName.org. The Pentagon has literally threatened to court-martial Christian troops if they talk about their faith in Jesus Christ. Lieutenant Commander Nate Christensen backpelled a little bit. He said this week, oh no, it's okay if they evangelize, but they can be punished if they proselytize. So what's the difference between these two words? If, if they're evangelizing, they won't be punished. If they're proselytizing, they will. Well, that's explained by Lieutenant Colonel Laurel Tingley, who said, on duty, Air Force members are free to express their religious beliefs as long as it does not make others uncomfortable proselytizing grows over that line. So in other words, you can talk about Jesus as long as nobody's offended. But the minute you talk about Jesus and somebody gets offended, you can be court-martialed for proselytizing? That's not right. Sign a petition today at PrayInJesusName.org. 
God bless you in Jesus' name. This is Chaplain Gordon James Klingenschmidt. Dr. Chaps, please join me every Saturday for two full hours as we report the news, discern the spirits, and pray the scriptures in Jesus' name. And then on Sunday, again, I invite you to join me for one hour Bible study that will help you understand the will of God for your life. That's three full hours of important programming every Saturday and Sunday right here on the Active Christian Media Network. And please support Randall and Stacy Harp at activechristianmedia.com. You are listening to On The Wall Radio on the Active Christian Media Network. I want to let you know, uh, I read something really totally cool today, uh, this morning, and it re- it, it re- it's in regards to Pastor Saeed. I want to read you his wife's, uh, Nagma's, uh, uh, Facebook update so you can hear what he, what, she, what she wrote about him. She wrote, Saeed's family got to visit him at Evan Prison today since he has now been released from solitary confinement. Uh, he said he felt many praying at and uh, the time in solitary was a time of intimacy with God. He said when he came out, the other prisoners said he was glowing. Wow. He, he was filled with more joy and peace after solitary than going in. All of the prisoners were shocked at the change. This is because of your prayers. Thank you. I will provide more updates as I get them. Please continue to pray for his health and his internal bleeding. Uh, he has not yet been treated. So that's that's good news. Isn't that cool? I mean, it's not cool. He hasn't been treated, but... It is cool that Pastor Saeed, the Lord obviously met him in solitary confinement. So just keep praying for him. And as I read her updates on uh, Facebook, I will spread them to my readers and tell you guys too. I cannot believe this hour is almost over, though. That's great. I have to wonder if the same would be true of us if we were subjected to solitary confinement for you know several days on end. Would that strengthen our relationship with God? Um I think you'd have to have a strong relationship to begin with in order for that sort of experience to deepen that relationship. Mm-hmm. Anyway, let's uh, press on. Uh, Jesus is saying that he's the good shepherd that lays down his life for the sheep. That um, he's he knows the sheep that belong to him and, and they know him. He says, even as the Father knows me, I also know the Father and lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 15. And I have other sheep which are not of this fold, Stacey or Stu, to point out, that aren't Mormons. Uh, Because Mormons use this text as saying, oh, it refers to uh, ancient civilizations in North America, that Jesus was going to come back a thousand years later. Uh, oh, it's it's just amazing to me how they can twist that. Uh, you know, I mean, yeah, it, it anyway. It, it uh, is. It's just amazing to me. I just have a hard time. Yes, the resurrected Christ, a thousand years later, came no, to North America and um, brought the gospel to these ancient civilizations of which there's not a shred of archaeological evidence for. Their existence, even though they're the great, uh, you know, great civilizations, the Lemonites and the Nehites and all these people, and um, no, no archaeological record of them. But hey, and here's the proof text right here, verse 16. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. Is anything more definitive than that? Than Jesus came to North America right, well, a thousand years. Let me let me tell you all, uh, Ed Decker, who is you know, uh, one of our hosts now on Saturday, on, on Sunday, I guess. You know, former Mormon, he did the movie The Godmakers. Anyway, Ed's show is now on our network. So if you if you want to hear the truth about what happens really inside the Mormon temples and the, all their theology and all that stuff, just listen to Ed's show. Just go through our archives. You'll see his show. The um, Decker Report. The Decker Report. And uh, he gets a lot of flack. This is a guy in his 80s, by really? the way. Really? He's in his 80s, yeah. Wow. And uh, in, he's still kicking. <laughs> Very much so. I think he's a few years younger than my dad. So, hmm. But anyway, there you go. 
Yeah, so he has other sheep not of this fold. Could it simply mean that non-Jews some Gentiles? He says, I must also lead those, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock, one shepherd. Hmm. One flock, one shepherd. Could that mean, like, uh, Jews and Gentiles, like Ephesians uh, tells us about the middle wall, the separation being, you know, taken down? Um I should have had that uh, uh, verse handy, but yeah, you can read in Ephesians chapter 2, I believe it is. Am I right, Stace? Or do you know what I'm talking about? You'd have to, you'd have to con- uh, complete your sentence. Okay. Uh, yeah, it is Ephesians uh, chapter 2. Okay, good. It's Ephesians 2, Randall. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Glad I could help. That's why I'm your help me. Uh, yeah, uh, let me just pick up a, a verse. Um, in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, uh, verse 11. Therefore, remember you, the nations, i.e., the you know the Gentiles, in times past were in the flesh, who were who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision, the flesh made by hands, and that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been made near by the blood of Christ. He is our peace, making us both one, and he has broken down the middle wall of partition between us having abolished in his flesh the enmity, the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, making peace between them, and so that he might reconcile both to God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity in himself. Anyway, so to me, that, you know, Scripture being the best commentary on Scripture I think that that's what Jesus is talking about here. He says, I have sheep not of this fold, and that I must also lead those, they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock, one shepherd. Uh, Jews and Gentiles uh, united in Christ uh, because he came to fulfill the law and um, take down that middle wall of separation. Um, Anyway, So, for this reason, verse 17, my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down from myself. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it again. I receive this commandment from my Father. That definitely, I think, makes him, uh, separates him again from all the other false messiahs. The false messiahs, who are thieves and robbers that came before him, Thaddeus and Judas of Galilee, uh, etc., they met their end. They tried to raise up, um, you know, the nation Israel, and they got some followers, a few hundred followers, maybe even uh, thousands, but it did not end well for them. Uh, they were eventually killed by someone, uh, you know, the Roman government who, or whomever, and that was the end of it. Uh, they wanted to, uh, you know, carry on and move onward and upward, but met their demise, uh, not by their plan. Uh, Jesus, on the other hand, says, I lay down my life. Not only is he laying it down, but he's taking it up again. <laughs> that totally separates him, even from uh, others that were resurrected that we see in the Old Testament. Um you know the one uh, woman's son, uh, you know, with uh, Elijah, and then um, Elijah resurrected. Uh, um, anyway, but there's uh, you know resurrections recorded in the Old Testament even, but those were resurrect. You know, through they were resurrected by the power of God through a human agent through a prophet or whatever, or the one case when the guy was let down and touched the bones. And, uh, you know, it's it was a surprise that these
these people are resurrected here, Jesus uh, predicts his death and his resurrection. Not only predicts that he's going to die and that he's going to resurrect, but he says he's the agent in both cases. I lay my down my life, and I will take it up again. Um, he's in control all the time. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down for myself. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it again. That makes him unlike any other claiming to be Messiah before or since. Amen. Um, you believe the show is almost over with? Uh, I guess I can. So a division occurred again among the Jews. Jesus has that. Uh, yeah, the Jews got divided again. How Jesus, is that possible? Jesus seems to have that uh, sort of knack for uh, bringing division among people. You know, between uh, a mother and a daughter, a father and a son. You know, uh, he's a Jesus is a divisive subject. If you know, if those who you know, for those who believe in him and his claims, they're going to be at odds with those who don't want to. And it's it, there are those who say, "Well, that's nice for you that you found something," but so often. There's an animosity against those who are followers of Christ. And it's, it's nothing new today. It was true even then. Him just being there, uh, speaking, the division uh, occurred again, John tells us, because of these words. And many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. You know, um, Why we, listen to him? Yeah. And that goes back to what we were talking about before with the... Uh, the whole blind man, even before that, that was, you know, as C.S. Lewis is, you know, his, his famous trilemma, you know, liar, lord, or lunatic. You have to make a choice. This, this, uh, any nonsense about being a, a great human teacher, that's not an option that he, he left open to us. He did not intend to. Uh, if, if you seriously listen to his claims, you've got to come to a decision. You know he's he's a liar, lord, or lunatic, and and for those who didn't want to accept his claims, they they threw both at him. He has a demon and is insane. There, he, he's he's a you know he's a lunatic and you know he's a demon. So has a demon. Don't listen to him. Others said these are not the words of one having been possessed by a demon. A demon is not able to open the eyes of. The blind. And even if he was, the problem is that anything done demonically doesn't last. Yeah. But in this case, I don't think a demon can open blind eyes anyway. And besides, do you think a demon would spit on somebody's eyes like Jesus did? Well, he spit in the ground and oh, made yeah, I mud. Know. I yeah. know. But do you think a demon would do it that way? No, he'd do it kind of like how Benny Hinn does stuff. <laughs> uh, I don't know about that. Um he just you should see him. He just he laughed and then he crossed his arms in front of his uh, chest like why did you say that? You're making me look bad. No, I was just trying to think of a place to put my arms other than you know, <laughs> elbows that are getting kinda of worn out on this mesh. Um Sure You know, I can't I can't help but think about Revelation when uh we're told that the beast will be there with what kind of wonders? Lying signs and wonders. Yeah, lying. The they're not actually true. Like Twitter. Not actually real real miracles. It's it's the nature of Satan. He's he's a liar and the father of it. He's and a liar, liar, liar pants on fire. And when it comes to even signs and wonders, they're lying wonders. Anyway, I think we need to stop for here because we're out of time. Okay, tomorrow. Randall is going to be at a conference, and guess what? I'm I'm not going to be with him. I'm going to be here uh, back on the show running this thing all by myself, so you can pray for us both. <laughs> all right, we'll be back tomorrow right now, right then, at the, same, at the same time. You guys have a good day, rest of your day, and we'll see you tomorrow, Lord willing. 
Thanks for listening. On the Wall Radio is a production of Active Christian Media. Please visit www.onthewallradio.com for more information on how to connect with us on Facebook and Twitter and to use our services to promote your product or service to the conservative Christian community.